Um, so I, I could have talked about bandits to do the, the continuation of uh, Gilles, but I won't. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a completely uh, different topic I'm working on uh, with uh, Nicolas Flammarion, which is about training of uh, two-layer uh, neural networks. So before I start, uh, who knows what is a neural network here and like kind of how it works? I mean, nobody knows how it exactly works, but let's assume we know. OK, so I, I try to, to go a bit slowly at the beginning uh, so that everyone can follow, because uh, then it's going to be very technical at the end. So I don't know how deep I'm going to go. Uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on uh, parametric supervised learning with neural networks. So I, I uh, have uh, n uh, observations from data points uh, of dimension d, so which is given by the xi. OK, and I'm uh, trying to predict uh, the labels yi, uh, which are given for my training data set. And for that, to predict them, I, I'm using a prediction function, which is given by uh, uh, my neural network. So um, a neural network is just, uh, so in my case, the superposition of uh, the composition of multiple layers. So for a layer, what I do is that given the input of my layer, I, uh, I proceed to a linear uh, matrix multiplication, uh, which gives which give me intermediate weights, and then I compose them with uh, a nonlinear activation function, which is uh, this uh, sigma function, and which will, will be the ReLU, so the positive part uh, in my case. Uh, and so I, I uh, do the composition of several layers in, in, uh, in that way until having my final output uh, of my neural network. Okay, and so the typical example that we give in class is the one of predicting uh, images of uh, either cats or dogs. Uh, so X is uh, actually a one image. So for one image, I have multiple pixels, which uh, is, uh, and so for each pixel, I have one scalar. Actually, I have three, so one for each color. And uh, then, uh, so this is very large dimension uh, uh, inputs X that represent uh, all the pixels of my images. And from these pixels, I'm trying to uh, determine uh, whether my image is about a cat or a dog, uh, which is the label uh, of my image. Okay. Um, so this is uh, uh, for it, and so in my case, I'm going to focus on uh, what I call the over-parameterized setting, in which uh, I have uh, the dimension of my parameter space, so my parameter space given by this big theta, which is much larger than both the dimension of my input and the number of training data points that I have. Okay, so I assume that I have many, many parameters to train in my network, and that it's even much bigger than the number of, uh, of uh, uh, data samples that I have and then the dimension of, uh, of my uh, data. OK, and so when we do that, in, in general, we uh, train them uh, doing uh, uh, empirical risk min minimization, so either uh, adding some regularization or not. Uh, so we're trying to minimize uh, the average loss, so for some, some given loss uh, uh, over my predictor, so over my training uh, samples. Plus, eventually, I add uh, some regularization term, uh, which helps me um, into guaranteeing, let's say, some uh, good properties about uh, my parameters. Uh, and so this is what we do when we train the, the, the model. But actually, our final goal is really to have a very small uh, test error, which is given by uh, the true loss I would have on new uh, data uh, uh, sample that I have not observed in my training data set. OK, so it's the expectation over the true distribution here of my, uh, of my data, while here I'm only minimizing over uh, the empirical distribution of my training data set. OK, so this is really the difference. And while I'm minimizing over this while doing the optimization, my true goal is that. But I, of course, I cannot do that because I do not observe the complete distribution of my data. And so when we do that, what, you observe, what we observe empirically uh, on some uh, uh, typical uh, image uh, data sets with the typical architectures is that when we train uh, models with different uh, optimization techniques. So GD stands for gradient descent, SGD for stochastic gradient descent, uh, and uh, OGM for uh, augmentation, and L2 for L2 regularization here. Uh, when, I, when I train so multiple uh, different optimization schemes, what you observe is that uh, first, my training accuracy uh, goes to 100%, so meaning that I'm able to predict perfectly every uh, uh, data point from my training data set. And in the meantime, my test accuracy is still pretty good. Uh, so let's forget about the first line, because it's kind of surprising. I believe that we can do better than that, actually, with this method. 
But so in the end, we still have uh, good uh, accuracy in the tracing set, which is uh, around uh, 90%, uh, uh, let's say, um, which is might be quite surprising for, for some people. At least it was a few years ago. Uh, uh, because here, especially, what we observe is that even when we do not regularize uh, with, uh, L2 re with L2 regularization, so with no regularization at all, we still have a good uh, test accuracy and uh, uh, while uh, perfectly predicting every training data point. OK? And so what's, what's uh, the main lesson from this table here is that we're able to have a zero training loss while still having a good generalization uh, over my new unseen data. OK, and so uh, inspired by this uh, table, I, I uh, wonder uh, this uh, following three uh, questions, uh, which are actually key to the understanding of uh, the training of neural networks in, in theory, uh, which is, uh, so do we uh, actually convert to zero training loss uh, when we train over parameterized models? Uh, why do they generalize so well? And uh, both of these questions are actually uh, connected to a third one, which is the one of uh, the role of initialization. Because here, uh, when we consider uh, neural networks, we have uh, non-convex uh, optimization losses. And because of the no this non-convexity, uh, initialization will play a very important role. And so we will uh, see more about that. But so initialization is very crucial here uh, and uh, has a major role in, in what's happening uh, next. OK? And so in this talk, I'm going to focus on a very uh, simple example for which we are able to do actually some math, uh, which is the one of two layers neural networks. So I only have two layers uh, that I apply in, in the composition uh, um, of my output. Uh, and I'm going to focus on, so as I said, ReLU activation, uh, and also so no regularization at all, and uh, gradient flow. OK, so I'm going to detail a bit more about that later. So here's the outline for, for the talk. But when did I start? Yeah. You have one hour. Yeah, but OK, yeah, OK, let's so, uh, yeah. <laughs> OK, let's do that approximately. OK, so at first, I'm going to present uh, uh, the setting and uh, then talk a bit about the role of initialization. And OK, I think there's one section that I'm missing here. And then I'm going to get into the technical stuff of uh, the early alignment phenomenon. And then I'm going to discuss a bit about its implications, bo both in terms of implicit bias and in terms of uh, optimization towards uh, a global minima. So the setting, as I uh, recall, is the following one. So we have n observations with uh, d dimension uh, uh, input uh, x and the uh, labels y. And so now we are training only, we're training only a two-layer neural network. So we can write now the output of my uh, neural network on uh, any input x as follows. So now my notation is w for the uh, intermediate uh, layer weights and a for the output layer weights. Okay. And I apply, as I said, the uh, ReLU activation function, which is just the positive part uh, of uh, the real number uh, z. OK, and so for this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, parameterization of my neural network, then I'm uh, training uh, my parameters following uh, uh, gradient flow. Uh, so gradient flow, you can see it as the limit of uh, gradient descent or even stochastic uh, gradient descent when you take the uh, learning uh, the step size to, uh, to 0. And so it's a continuous uh, approximation of it. And because of the non-discontinuity of a uh, ReLU at 0, here actually it's not, a, it's not a gradient flow, but it's a subgradient flow. And so it's not an ordinary uh, differential equation, but it's actually what we call a differential inclusion, where I have this uh, following uh, uh, inclusion at any time t. So my, uh, the derivative of my parameters is in some uh, set uh, given by the Clarkson differential of my loss. Uh, but uh, for simplicity, uh, let's uh, just forget about this uh, non-differentiability of ReLU at zero. And uh, um, where do I have that? Yeah, and let's just assume that the derivative of ReLU is uh, uh, the heavy side function everywhere, uh, taking value uh, uh, zero at zero, for example. But uh, actually, all the results I will present to you are true for any solution of this uh, differential inclusion because there are actually multiple solutions uh, to this inclusion. And so here, as I said, like my loss, I do not have uh, any uh, regularization. So here I'm only minimizing over the uh, empirical risk uh, without any regularization. Uh, and I could either be in the regression case with a uh, uh, square loss or a, a classification case with a cross entropy loss with the binary labels. So what is nice with uh, subgradient flow is that 
So now I have a continuous uh, uh, equation. So actually, it allows a simpler uh, analysis. Uh, but it's still, uh, especially in that case, uh, quite intricate because of also of the non-differentiability of the value at zero. So we still have to do a careful analysis, but we, are, we still manage to, to uh, say something, as you will see uh, later. So as I said, the initialization plays a crucial role in that case uh, because of the non-convexity of our optimization scheme. Okay, And because of that, uh, you might end up in different uh, uh, convergence planes depending on your initialization. Um, and so the, the first result, the first big result for the optimization of neural networks uh, was the one of uh, a neural tangent uh, kernel, which was so what we call NTK, which was uh, first given by uh, Jaco and co-authors and also uh, Du and co-authors, which said that uh, if we take uh, a Gaussian initialization for both my uh, intermediate and my output layers, uh, and we take a very large number of um, of neurons. So here it was. Uh, so it is a polynomial number in my uh, number of eight of the training points. Uh, so if the, the number of neurons I have is uh, larger than some polynomial in my uh, number of training points, then with high probability I can show that the loss uh, will uh, go down to zero at an exponential speed. So this is what we call a linear rate in uh, in optimization. Uh, where new, so new, I'm not going to get into the detail, but it's uh, the uh, smallest singular value of uh, my NTK uh, matrix. Uh, but uh, let's forget about that, but just see that this implies actually that my training loss will indeed converge to zero uh, for this uh, type of initialization, and it will do so at a quick rate uh, that is quite of explicit. So that is a really strong and really nice result, and that's why actually uh, it got uh, quite uh, uh, famous at the time, and it's still uh, nowadays. Uh, but actually, there is a, a but uh, with this result, which is the one of uh, a lazy uh, regime, uh, which says that actually when you do that, there is no real feature learning happening um, while you train, in the sense that the the final uh, point you converge to in terms of uh, your parameters theta is not far from your initial point theta. So you can show that the difference between your uh, last uh, iterate and your uh, initial one actually is very small. And uh, so this is actually due to, to the large initialization that we use here uh, in the setting. And because of that, then we, we do not really learn any features. We just slightly uh, adjust uh, the weights of the layers to, to just fit the data. But we do not learn uh, uh, something meaningful. Uh, and this observation is actually due to uh, several authors, including uh, Shiza and, uh, uh, and uh, other co-authors, uh, which shows that so we, they illustrated that uh, more uh, rigorously by, uh, uh, and more generally by uh, showing that if you take a scale of initialization lambda m, so recall that m is the width of uh, my network, uh, then I can show that depending on the, on the so, depending, so if lambda m uh, does not decay uh, fast enough to zero, so which is given exactly by uh, this condition here, uh, then uh, you can show that the difference between your initial and the uh, final uh, parameter is very small in norm, so meaning that the neurons barely move. And moreover, the model uh, will behave uh, almost as its uh, linearization around uh, the initi initialization point. Okay, and so this is actually how you do the proof of NTK. It's just you show you do like a Taylor approximation, and you can show that thanks to that it holds for the whole trajectory of training. And this is actually why you have uh, such a fast rate. Uh, of convergence towards the mi uh, minimizer of the loss. And so this is quite unfortunate because this, uh, this result here, uh, it says that we do not really uh, learn anything. We mostly do just do a linear regression on the uh, random features uh, that were given at the uh, end of the uh, uh, first layer of the network. Okay? Um, and so it's so it's not that impressive, and also it's not really uh, representative of what's happening in reality when we train neural networks. Uh, of course, in, rea in reality, we do learn features, and so we really have a, a big difference between what we have at the end and at the beginning uh, of the training, and so it's not uh, something that is explained by uh, uh, the NTK regime here. And so here, let's illustrate that on a simple uh, example. So this is the kind of plot I'm going to show you a lot uh, in the following of the presentation, so let me uh, describe it a bit. Um, so here I have uh, 
five uh, training points in uh, dimension one. Okay, so I'm doing really dimension one uh, regression. Uh, but actually, it's dimension two because I have a second coordinate uh, that is given by one and actually represents a, a, a bias term that I can use in my uh, uh, neural network. And so I'm just trying to fit these uh, five uh, green points <coughs> with uh, uh, an overparameterized uh, neural network. So I, don't, I think here it's like 200 neurons or maybe something like that. Uh, just trying to fit uh, five points in dimension one. Uh, and so in uh, the green curve is uh, uh, the prediction uh, of my uh, uh, neural network uh, at uh, the iteration, at the consider iteration. And then I also have blue stars. So each blue star is one neuron of my network, okay, whose uh, x value is given uh, by the, the kink of uh, its associated uh, ReLU. Do we have a chalk? Oh, yes. Thank you. So if uh, so, when you have a ReLU function, it looks like this, OK? And so for each neuron, I have an, associ an associated ReLU function. And so let's assume I have this ReLU function. Then my blue star uh, will, so its x value will be uh, on this axis. OK, it's close to white. So its x value will be given on this axis. And uh, then the y value of my blue star will be given by uh, the norm, actually, of, uh, of uh, my uh, W, or qu almost equivalently, like the value of the output layer uh, associated to it. So for example, I will have my blue star, so in red uh, on the board, here for this uh, ReLU function. OK? And so now let's have a look at what's happening uh, when we do train over time on a neural network. So at first, I have. So at first, I have uh, uh, something that is uh, quite random, which is just given by my, uh, by my random initialization. And so very quickly, we will be able to fit all the, all the training points uh, of my data set. And uh, in the meantime, you see that the blue stars, they do not move that much from uh, uh, the beginning. And this is exactly what is predicted by uh, the uh, tra uh, lazy training and the lazy regime. OK, and so you do see that here. In the end, the function that we get, yes, it feeds uh, the data points, but it's not really natural. It's, we do not really understand why we should feed it that way. Uh, there's no, nothing natural or even uh, explainable about that. Uh, and just what's happening because of uh, the NTK uh, regime. So in opposition to the NTK regime, I'm going to focus on uh, the, what we call the rich regime which is the one where uh, feature learning uh, should happen, which is the choice of initialization scale given by uh, 1 over square root of m. OK, so if you recall uh, Shiza's result. So here, the, the, the limit case, so the larger uh, scales of lambda m that we can take such that we do not have lazy regime again is really the one of 1 over square root of m. OK, and so this is exactly what we're going to use here. And even I'm going to be a bit stronger here because I'm going to use actually a lambda over square root of m. And I'm going to take lambda very small with respect to 1, but independent of m. OK, so lambda is fixed with respect to m, but very small with respect to 1. So in that case, feature learning should happen uh, thanks to, uh, uh, well, given by the prediction uh, of uh, Shizan co-authors. And especially, I'm going to use even a, a simplification of the initialization which will be useful for uh, uh, my, uh, my analysis later, which is the one of dominated initialization in the sense that I will choose uh, uh, at initialization the uh, output uh, layer to be larger in absolute value, or, well, in norm, than uh, the associated neuron on, in the input layer. OK, so it's a bit, uh, it's not really what we do in practice, but it's just for the uh, simplification of analysis. And an, an example where we have these conditions is to choose uh, AI, uh, so which is either a plus or minus lambda over square root of m, and WI uh, uh, chosen uniformly at random in, the, in a ball of the scale uh, lambda over square root of m. So that's, uh, that's the initialization I'm going to consider until the end of the talk now, uh, and uh, I'm really going to uh, focus on that. Uh, and so in that case, this is what we call the rich regime. Of course, it's unfortunately harder to analyze. Uh, because uh, everything uh, in terms of analysis is uh, harder because we do not have this uh, Taylor approximation that holds for the whole training uh, process. 
uh, but it is uh, really nice in uh, in uh, in uh, what's happening uh, in practice in such in such regimes uh, because we have a, uh, an implicit bias towards a simple solution. So I'm going to, of course, uh, detail more about that. Uh, but it requires a uh, much uh, more uh, intricate analysis, and we are not able to say as much as uh, we, we do in uh, the NTK case. So let's illustrate now the rich regime in the same example of uh, five data points. So first, at initialization, because I take a small initialization, then my estimated function is uh, close to zero. So at first, I am I'm close to zero, and all my, all my neurons in norm are also close to zero. Okay. And so then here's what's happening when I train it. So at first, nothing is, is happening in terms of my estimated function. But you can see that the blue star, so each neuron, is moving significantly from its initialization point. <coughs> and so it, it takes much more time to, uh, to converge. But in the end, it still actually converges to uh, an interpreting function of, uh, of my data points. And in a very uh, specific way. Like here, you see that a lot of. Uh, intriguing stuff is happening. Uh, actually, you can see that I have uh, my neurons that are aligned uh, in a few directions. And so actually, uh, in the end, you see that this neural network, it could be represented by only a three neuron, uh, maybe four, because they, they might be one that we do not see here, uh, by only a three neuron network, which would be given by a single neuron here, a single neuron uh, equivalent to that one, and a single neuron here, OK? And so meaning that even though I'm uh, overparameterized here, I could use uh, an equivalent uh, neural network with uh, uh, much less neurons uh, in its parameterization, OK? And so in the end, I converge towards something that is equivalent to a not overparameterized uh, uh, neural network, OK? And so this is the kind of, um, of result that uh, now I'm, I'm going to try to explain to you and uh, why it's happening uh, when we do uh, assume a small initialization scale. And so this is mostly uh, due to what I call the early alignment phenomenon, uh, which is due to the fact that my, uh, my neurons at the early stage of training, they will, mostly, they will move significantly in terms of uh, direction. So you saw that they moved a lot on the x-axis at the beginning, the blue stars, while not moving at all, or uh, almost not at all, uh, on the y-axis. And so what is nice about the two-layer neural network is that we can we can actually write uh, an equation so like an ODE or a differential inclusion, actually. So here it should be a, an inclusion uh, for each individual neuro neuron i. When we do like three layers or more layers uh, neural network, it's not available anymore. But that's what's nice and what allows a lot of nice analysis for two layer neural networks is that we have this uh, individual equation for each uh, neuron. And so I have this equation, meaning uh, that the derivative of my uh, weight will be given by ai times some uh, vector di that I'm going to uh, explain later. And the same uh, for uh, the derivative of my output weight, which is given by the scalar product between wi and this same uh, vector d. So this vector d, it's OK, so it's quite uh, unnatural. Uh, well, not, not quite unnatural, but quite technical. And it's just a consequence of the, of the gradient of my loss. So here, I, I wrote it in a general way. But if you consider, uh, so it's, if you consider it, it for the square loss, for example, so square loss, my di will be given by um, this function. So That's uh, i. Yeah, okay, here j uh, should be i. t of xk times um, y. No, it should be it's a minus here. So h theta xk minus y k times xk. Okay, so it's. So just to explain a bit about this formula, this is just the derivative of the of the value, okay? So it's so uh, and so actually it should be a subderivative, but just for simplification, let's just uh, write it that way. And this is just in some sense the derivative of the loss uh, function, which is a square loss uh, in that case, okay? So this is a d d1 uh, l uh, term. 
Okay, and so what's important to, to notice about this D is that it depends in W only in the signs of uh, its scalar products with um, my different training uh, points uh, xk. So this is what I'm going to call the activation, the activation of the different activations of uh, a neuron. And it only depends in theta, actually, in the estimated function h uh, theta t taken at all my training points xk. Okay? And so notably, what you can say is that if I have two neurons which are in the same sector, meaning in a, a, a same cone, a, a cone for which the activations are the same with my training points, then they will follow exactly the same uh, ODE up to a rescaling uh, given by uh, this AI, okay, or this uh, norm of WI. Well, no, this AI, yeah, yeah let's just focus on that one. If they, have the, yeah, if they are in the same cone, then they are going to follow exactly the same ODE up to the rescaling given by AI. Okay, and so this, is, this will uh, be helpful actually in genesis because then my uh, movements will be uh, kind of uh, almost the same inside uh, each uh, sector. And these sectors, they are fixed uh, by my uh, training data set. <coughs> okay, and so why, uh, why did I choose uh, uh, this uh, dominated this initialization I mentioned to you uh, earlier? Was that we have that uh, very useful uh, lemma of balancedness, uh, which occurs uh, thanks to the homogeneity of the ReLU uh, activation, which says that while training the difference, uh, the square difference between uh, my uh, uh, output uh, weight and my uh, intermediate weight uh, will be constant. Okay, this is actually this is just given by uh, deriving uh, the derivative of this quantity. Of this quantity and using uh, the formula, the ODs I just gave you uh, earlier. And it will exactly tell you that this is constant. And in particular, with this uh, choice of initialization, what is nice is that the output weight uh, will be constant in sign uh, the whole uh, training time. Okay? And so, thanks to that, uh, now I can just talk about a positive neuron or a negative neuron and it will remain positive. So, positive being the sign of its output weight. It will remain positive for the whole uh, training and neg or negative during the whole training. And so it helps a lot in the analysis and it's uh, very, very uh, helpful and very important actually. <coughs> and uh, now also what I can do, thanks to this balancedness uh, lemma, is that I can uh, renormalize my uh, intermediate weight by the output weight AI. So I can do that because it's, it's not zero. And uh, so this term is actually inside the unit ball uh, of RG. Okay, and so now I can uh, look at a new ODE, which is the derivative of this renormalized uh, vector. So I'm going to call that the direction. Okay, it's not exactly on the sphere, but it's, you can assume it's on the sphere. And actually, we can see that this equation will be, uh, uh, we can compute the ODE for this term, and it will be that one. So it's not very uh, meaningful, a uh, uh, thing like that. But what's important is that this term, all these terms, so assu let's assume that uh, W bar is, is uh, in the unit sphere. Okay, not in the unit ball, but in the unit sphere. Then you can see that all these terms, they, they do not scale with lambda, like they are in, uh, in big theta 1 in terms of uh, order of magnitude. While on the other hand, when you look at the derivative of AI, which I recall is uh, an upper bound on the, uh, on the uh, in its absolute value is an upper bound on the norm of your neuron uh, W, well, then this scales actually with the norm of WI, which is, or with AI, if you prefer, <coughs> which is uh, very small at initialization and the scales with lambda, okay? And so you see here that you have two very different orders of magnitudes between my two equations. One which uh, is uh, quite large, and one which is very small, when I, especially when I take lambda uh, down to zero and the m goes to infinity, okay? And actually, thanks to this observation, I can, uh, I can say that my, uh, m uh, my uh, directional movement will happen in a time uh, pretty small, which is of big theta 1, while uh, my, uh, my norm movement will happen in a time that is actually big, and which is at least one uh, log 1 over lambda, where I recall lambda, I can take it very small. And so because of this, so this, in uh, some sense, with, uh, with words, 
This explains exactly the early alignment phenomenon that you saw earlier in the in the in the animation, where my uh, so my uh, directional movement will happen uh, very fast, and uh, in the meantime you will not see any difference in terms of the weight uh, of the norm of my weights. Okay, and this is actually due to this uh, simple observation here. Uh, but we still have to do to show it uh, more carefully. But uh, this is exactly this observation. <coughs> and actually, because in this whole uh, big uh, theta one uh, time, which I call the early alignment phase, because uh, during this whole time my uh, neuron, my norm of neurons, does not move uh, that much, uh, I can approximate it. I can approximate it close to zero during this whole phase, and so my estimated function will be almost zero between this be, uh, during this whole. Uh, early alignment phase. Okay, and this will actually uh, simplify a lot of stuff because if we assume this estimation uh, function uh, to be zero, then we can see that the directional uh, equation, uh, directional movement equation now is given by uh, this equation, and so now I have a zero here instead of a h of a theta, and so here this equation we can directly interpret it. As uh, either a gradient ascent or a gradient uh, descent in, in, in flow uh, over uh, some piecewise linear continuous function g uh, given by uh, this function. Okay, uh, so let's not uh, get into the details of what exactly does g means, but the idea is that from here I can say that now my directional movement during this early alignment phase it's uh, either following a gradient ascent or gradient descent flow, and from there. I can actually show that in a fast enough time, it will converge towards the critical point uh, of this function g that uh, we're either trying to maximize or minimize. Okay. And actually, so in many cases, what we observe is that this function g it has very small uh, critical points, meaning that my uh, neurons will align towards a few key directions. Okay. And so even if I'm overparameterized, then at the end of my early alignment phase, I will have only a few directions that will be representing uh, the different values of my neurons. Uh, and so this is a phenomenon that has been uh, used to describe uh, the training dynamics for over a lot of uh, different uh, examples of uh, data. Uh, and that also has been uh, qualitatively described. And here, the, our goal was in this work first to, to try to give a rigorous and a quantitative uh, statement for, for this phenomenon. And so this is what we, we got with this uh, uh, theorem. So maybe I'm not going to focus too much about that because it's very technical. Um, but so the idea is that we have a time uh, tau that we are able to give, for which at, at the end of this time tau, uh, my uh, neuron norms didn't move much uh, from the uh, initial point. And moreover, uh, nearly all of my uh, neurons will be aligned in direction uh, towards a critical point uh, of G. Okay. So this is a uh, kind of uh, how to show in a general way. So here we rely on a simplifying assumption uh, uh, about G that it has no saddle points. But we also have a more general ver version in the paper, but it's even more uh, complicated uh, to parse. So let's uh, I'm not going to detail about that. <coughs> and so one of the main features of this uh, theorem is that so this is happening for an initialization scale that is uh, smaller than some threshold. And this threshold does not depend on uh, the width of my uh, network, okay, and the number of neurons that I'm using in the parameterization. It's only depending on uh, my data set uh, uh, and uh, the epsilon that I choose here, uh, but epsilon is arbitrary. Okay, so let's illustrate that again on the same uh, example as before. So now I'm going to show you a second type, uh, type of plot. Oh. It was not supposed to start yet. So we're now... Uh, I have a 2D plot uh, in a polar uh, coordinates. So again, each star is a neuron of my network. Uh, and so it's just represented in a polar, uh, co in polar coordinates. And here I moved, uh, I shifted away the zero point into an inner circle so that we are still able to show the directional movement while sticking close to the zero point in terms of uh, norm. Okay. And uh, each uh, sector is, delim is delimited by the uh, green uh, lines. And so again, while we train here, we observe uh, even be better on this uh, plot on the right that my neurons, they will move in terms of direction uh, up to uh, to some key and uh, a few uh, directions only 
uh, during this phase while still uh, remaining close to zero. And so you see the here that at the end, I only have a few directions left uh, for my representation. Okay, So actually, this zone is a dead zone because here, your derivative will be zero forever. So let's forget about this zone. And here you see that, uh, except from this zone, I have like uh, uh, five maybe directions left uh, towards which my neurons are aligned. So in the end, here I'm almost already equivalent to a five neurons uh, neural network. Okay, and so now I'm not over parameterized uh, again. And then I'm keeping this uh, kind of uh, few directions uh, in the representation, and I'm keeping it at, until the end. So this is something that we're not able to explain uh, rigorously yet, but this is exactly what we observe in uh, most of the cases that we we, f we keep this. Uh, a sparsity representation actually until the end of the training. <coughs> and so this phenomenon, it has a, a huge uh, benefit, which is the one of implicit regularization. Uh, and so I'm going to first uh, recall a bit or explain a bit what is uh, what, what I call this implicit regularization or implicit bias in uh, uh, machine learning. How do I have time? Yeah, okay, no, maybe I, I will skip it because I do not have that much time. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the idea of uh, implicit bias is that uh, even though you might have a lot of uh, global minimizer uh, in your uh, uh, parameter space, uh, due to the optimization scheme that you use, you will converge towards a, uh, a given and a specific minimizer uh, of your loss. And so this minimizer, when you when you when you look at its properties, it can actually have very nice properties, which uh, are, for example, being the one of uh, being the, the interpolator of minimal norm or something like that. And so this is something that we know uh, very well for the case of linear regression or for very simple architectures of uh, uh, of neural networks. But uh, as soon as we consider nonlinear activations, then we do not know much in uh, in the literature. Uh, but the belief is still that when we consider a small initializations regime, uh, then we will end up with uh, simple estimators. Okay, so here simple. Uh, what is a simple estimator? It's not really well defined, but it, when I mean it, I, I either mean that uh, its parameters, uh, the parameters are small in norm, or that I can represent my network with a much smaller one, which is what I call a sparse representation of the network. Okay, so I'm able to represent my network. <laughs> with only a few neurons, okay, and so when uh, when we when we see uh, what I just talked about with the early element ph phenomenon, it's directly related to this uh, sparse representation uh, uh, result. <coughs> and uh, more precisely, what I I told you is that at the end of the early alignment phase, we have this sparse representation of the network, and so so then we hope that this sparse representation is preserved along training. Uh, so that at the end we still end up with something sparse. Okay, this is uh, not um, uh, acquired at all. This is not uh, something that is automatic, but this is like a, a, a belief and what we observe in many uh, empirical cases. And so I really think that this implicit bias result is related to uh, uh, the early alignment phenomenon and the fact that after this early phase you only have a few directions left in terms of uh, your neurons. So this. Okay, uh, let's skip that part. <laughs> so, th so this was about the, the main benefits, uh, in my opinion, of the uh, uh, early alignment uh, phenomenon, so which was the one of implicit bias. Uh, in the meantime, it also, unfortunately, have a huge drawback, which is the one of reaching a global minimum. So, of course, because uh, the uh, initialization point where all my parameters are zero I is a saddle point. And so then, because of that, first, it's obvious that at least I, I will need an arbitrary long time uh, to, to do my training because I, 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 initialize, I initialize close to a saddle point. And so it will be at least detrimental in terms of uh, optimization, uh, of the time of optimization. But actually, it's even worse than that. Actually, I'm even able to show you that no matter how long you train your neural network and no matter how huge you, you take uh, the overparameterization of your network, you might not even be able to overfit your, your training uh, set. And thus, not, you might not even be able to reach a global minimizer of your loss. 
Okay, and so to show you that, I can even show you it on a very sim show, show it to you on a very uh, simple example of data, which is the one of uh, three points in dimension two. Okay, and so even in dimension one, actually, with an implicit with a bias term. <coughs> so I just take these three points, where the their second coordinate is fixed to be one, and I will show you exactly what I told you. And what is uh, uh, remarkable about these three uh, points is that. So now I'm gonna uh, sorry. Now I'm gonna focus on uh, the regression tax. So I'm minimizing over the square loss. And so what is remarkable about these uh, three points is that first, because of this one coordinate of the second coordinate fixed to one, uh, they are all uh, po they are all positively uh, correlated uh, with each other. And also, all my labels are positive here. And because of these two observations, actually, there is in, th in this case there is a single non-trivial uh, critical direction of my uh, function g. So I recall g was a function driving the early alignment phenomenon. And so for this function g, I have only one critical direction that is not zero, and which is given by uh, the sum of uh, yk xk divided by n. OK, and so because of that, uh, yeah. So because of that, at the end of uh, my early alignment phase, all my neurons will be aligned towards a, a single direction given by this d star. OK? And so from then, I won't be able to move away from that uh, single neuron representation of my network. And so then I'm able to show that in the end, uh, you will converge towards a neuron that is actually equivalent to a single neuron, being actually the neuron uh, 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 of the uh, ordinary least square regression that you could do uh, on, your, on your data. And so what is remarkable about this result is that, as I told you, like your training loss won't be zero, but will be something uh, that does not, uh, that is uh, in, uh, of order one. And so you're not able to, to, um, to uh, overfit your data. And this is even true if you take, so yeah, because here your lambda star again, it does not depend on the width m. And so it's even true if you take an infinite number of neurons. Okay, even if you, uh, uh, even if you optimize over an infinite number of neurons, you, you might not even be able to overfit three ridiculous data points in dimension two. And yes, OK, and so this result, um, it might be surprising for, for uh, people in the field, especially because it's kind of con contradicting uh, uh, this uh, result by uh, uh, Linaik, Shiza, and uh, Francis Bach, which said that if you consider so the switch regime uh, initialization, and that you take a, uh, an infinite number of neurons uh, in your network, then at convergence, your loss, your training loss will be zero. Okay, and actually the tiny difference between these two settings is the one of smooth activations. And so why we do not observe the same result in our case is really because we do not have smooth activations, but we have instead ReLU activations, which are not differentiable in zero. And actually the smoothness here in this result is what allows to preserve uh, what, what they call omnidirectionality of the weights. So um, this omnidirectionality is the fact that the weights represent all the possible directions in your space uh, at any time. And so this is something that is preserved in the case of uh, uh, smooth activations, but is not anymore when you have uh, non-smooth activations as ReLU. Uh, and then this property is actually key to show that you can, that you can converge towards a global minimizer of your loss. OK, and so let's illustrate that on, uh, on my uh, three points data uh, example. So at first, so here I think I went really brutal. I think I have like 200,000 uh, neurons uh, trying to fit only uh, three data points. And you see, so at initialization, this is what I call the omnidirectionality here. Like all the directions in my uh, in R2 are represented by uh, my uh, directions of uh, weights. <coughs> and so during training, at first I have this early alignment uh, phenomenon. So where uh, so the purple uh, stars here, they are the positive neurons of my network. And so you see that at the end of this early alignment phase, all my positive neurons, they will be towards a single direction, which is the one of D star that I uh, mentioned you uh, uh, about uh, later. Uh, I also have some uh, purple uh, weights here, actually. But here again, it's a dead zone where you do not move at all uh, once you're, you're there. It's, it's like a, a black hole. But in the meantime, I have like uh, so negative neurons quite uh, 
like everywhere in terms of direction. But actually, uh, I will explain to you why, why they are useful, why, why they are useless, and they will stay close to zero uh, along training. So after this early alignment phase, I have a first growth phase <coughs> where so my uh, positive neurons, which now behave uh, as a single neuron, will grow in norm uh, until uh, reaching actually so this uh, 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 linear uh, regressor uh, of your data. Uh, and actually, then you, you, will, you will get stuck actually in this uh, representation, and you will not uh, move uh, away from that. Actually, you, you could move out by uh, adding some norm in your uh, negative neurons that are, here, that are here. But actually, I designed the example in such a way that once you're here, so in this uh, configuration, uh, adding a negative neuron can only hurt you in terms of loss. And so because you're, doing, uh, you're, you're trying to minimize your loss, you're never uh, creating any negative neurons, actually. What you would need to, to fit uh, these, data, uh, these data points would be two positive neurons. Uh, but here you have a single positive neuron av available, and you're not able to break it into two uh, from here. Okay. <coughs> so this is really what's happening when you do uh, do it, and you, so you could let it run forever, and it will not uh, move away uh, from that configuration where you're not able to to fit all your data points. Okay. So in conclusion. Uh, what what I, I like to say about all of this at the end is that we have a trade-off actually between small and large initialization. So when we do large initialization, what's nice is that we can quickly find the global minimum of our loss, but then we have no feature learning happening, so which might actually hinder uh, your generalization loss on a new unseen data set, uh, data points uh, afterwards. And also that is not that much representative of what you observe in practice. <coughs> but on the other end, uh, when you do a small initialization, so it's nice because it, it yields uh, some nice implicit bias, for example, having a sparse representation of my network at the end of training, but also it can, it can hurt in terms of finding a global minimum, and you might not even be able to find a global minimum uh, if you're too extreme in the, in the scale uh, that you use. And so my guess is that when you consider intermediate regimes of initialization, you might get, of course, both of both worlds, but uh, it's even harder to prove something for intermediate results than it is for uh, extreme regimes as one of large or small initializations. So thank you for, for being here and uh, for listening to me. Any questions to Etienne? Thank you for your presentation. Just about the last example, uh, uh, do you think it's much of a problem that finally you get to a linear uh, regression because uh, in terms of generalization, finally, uh, Maybe yes. it's better than uh, overfitting. So yeah, so it's a very interesting uh, remark and question. So that's the kind of uh, consideration that we do have now. Like, uh, yeah, is it really a, a problem? So on this paper, the, the focus was really from an optimization point of view. So just like we take uh, three data points and uh, can we uh, overfit uh, them? But you're right. So now we are. So we are. Uh, we hope to submit a paper at ICLR. <laughs> so I have to work on that afterwards. Uh, that considers exactly what you say, where we're trying to do more from a statistical point of view. So what if I take data points from a generalized uh, uh, distribution, and then what happens when I take uh, this number of data points very large? And actually, yeah, it might be uh, beneficial to you to, might n to not overfit actually your data points. But it really depends on the distribution of your data afterwards. Here, we assume nothing about the distribution. Uh, there is no statistical point of view here. But yes, it's really... Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, it might not be hurtful to not uh, overfit your data. It might be, be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have, uh, I have about a question about uh, like the impact of the regularizations that you use, or like uh, the gradient, uh, like the optimizer that you want to use. Yeah. So those are the results with the stochastic gradient descent, but uh, does it extend <laughs> also to like all other optimizer, like uh, Adam, or at least like empirically? So, so here it's uh, it's great. It's uh, for gradient flow, all the theoretical results, and the experiments. It's for uh, uh, gradient uh, full batch uh, gradient descent. Uh, but yeah, I guess it should it should at least hold for uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent. Yeah, for Adam, you're right. It might not hold because you have this renormalization of the gradient, and so actually the saddle you might escape from it very very quickly. And so I I, I guess it's totally different what's happening for Adam, and uh, because you do not have this. Uh, slow phase uh, where you, you turn around the saddle point and you, you're trying to escape from it with Adam just because of the renormalization of the gradient, then you, you should leave it very quickly. So yeah, I, I think for Adam and this kind of uh, optimizers, it should be very different. Yeah. 
Uh, the balancedness limit depends on the fact that you use a uh, relu activation function. Uh, yes, so it depends. Uh, where was it? It's it depends on the fact that uh, you're, you have a one homogeneous uh, activation function uh, and that you're, you are continuous in time. Hope I went too far. Yes, it's just because of the. Um, yes, it's just because yeah, you 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 could have that even for. So it's a, a very well known result. Uh, it's in many papers. It's just as soon as you consider uh, one homogeneous activation. So the fact that. So, for those of you who do not see what I'm talking about, is that you have sigma of lambda z equal lambda of sigma z for any. Uh, positive lambda. And so just because of that, then you can show that you have balancedness. And even if you have a, a more than two layers in our network, you will preserve balancedness between your uh, successive uh, layers. OK? And, but, it's, but it's also due to the fact that you're using a gradient flow. And actually, with gradient descent, you might lose it. But it's a second order term. So it's, it's not something you really uh, observe in practice. If you smooth a little bit the value function, then the results are not. Uh... Yes, no. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.